right, uh, we're here in Kentucky. Old Kentucky, uh, we're north considerably of uh, Clay County, Kentucky, where we have found many symbols. But what is amazing is that along this uh, river, which we'll show you a shot of here in a little bit, you have the highway of the past gone years. And the same travelers, evidently, that hit West Virginia, in as much as there is even a, Lib a Libyan signs uh, on over the ancient Ogham. Ogham probably uh, dating somewhere from 500 to 800 AD because it is vowelless and a fantastic find. I'll be showing you more of it, but first I want to introduce you to the gentleman that um, called us to our attention and um, I know you're going to enjoy meeting him. Mr. Michael Griffith. Michael, thank you very much for having us and Hello, Dr. Murray. sharing this with us. And say a few words to the folks. He's one of he studies with us and is quite a student on his own. Feel free. Okay, we're on the Middle Fork River here in Breathitt County, and uh, we don't want to give the exact location of where this find is, you know, because you have vandals and teenagers that likes to spray paint and everything. Uh, this was brought to my attention. Uh, my sister is an art teacher at a local school, and a young lady in her class, they was studying art appreciation. And uh, she was looking through this book, and she said, I've seen some symbols that resemble that, some inscriptions. And uh, so she brought the school camera over and started snapping these pictures. And uh, my sister sent them to doctors all over the place, and none of them knew what it was. And uh, I was accidentally talking to my mother on the phone, and she told me about the pictures. And I said, what do they look like? And she told me, I said, well, it's Olga. I mean, I knew immediately what it was. And uh, then after I got, you know, just three or four pictures of it, I, I know I better come on over and look at it before something happened. And uh, we came over and done a little cleaning here, as you can see, just a little lacking and mud was on it with just a straw brush, just for picture clarity. And uh, this is what we come up with. Well, that's great. We're sure glad you did, Michael, because you were absolutely correct. It is Ogham. Now, I want to show you, and then we're going to uh, etch, whereby it shows up better on camera, and it must be the right hand. You'll remember the symbol in, where was it, Horse Creek. And maybe we'll show you a little cut of Horse Creek here, the rebus. And here is a beautiful rebus, the right hand of God. I'll take my hand away, and you can see the rebus in Ogham, a uh, chi, and we will do the translating on the remainder of it yet at a future time. But I want to highlight only the rebus, and another rebus, the same, here at this location, and we'll take another look at it. Again, Michael, thank you very much for having us. Okay, it's Dr. A, Murray. A priceless uh, find, certainly is. I thought this was a quaff when I first seen it right here. Uh huh. Does that extend on up or does it extend back? I, I believe that's been scraped. I do. of the wrist right here and back of the hand. Here? Uh-huh. Yeah. Here we have the rebus now highlighted and almost from experience in West Virginia this is going to be the right hand of God in a rebus with the adjoining ogham adding to it. I just wanted you to see a little bit of how it's done. Now what we really have here is the palm of the hand is there's sort of a depression here. You can't see it but I'm going to say that it is sunken approximately a quarter to three-eighths inches from the surface of the rock. Someone went to a great deal of work and of course we have Ogham here which 
We'll explain that uh, following. So, a rebus, the hand, right hand, only the right hand will fit it. Here you have one, two, three, four, and the thumb uh, of um, the right hand of God, Rebus. I'm sure that's what it will check out to. If not, when we translate the Ogham, then we'll have a look at it. We will now etch in the Ogham surrounding it and take a shot of that and then hopefully find the translation. Okay, here we have now the Rebus, the right hand of God. And let's take each of these sections and we'll go from there. Again, I would remind you that um, the material that we have highlighted this with does not stain, has no chemical reaction to anything in the area, and simply washes away when we're through with it with, with water direct from the river and leaves no after effects whatsoever. Always be very careful uh, if we set an example that you would want to follow. Know first what you're doing and then do it, but don't use paint best not to use chalk in the very lines themselves but um, uh, this this solution works very well okay. here we have another let's make this the wrist and you see another right hand of God here we'll be filling this in however this is a little different than the other because notice the cross and then at the same time notice the roll meaning Christ, Christos, inside the palm of the hand of God. Now we'll paint this and let you have another look at it. All right, good day to you. God bless you. It's so good to see you. And here we are back at the chapel after having translated the stones in Kentucky. And I would, I would like to say that never before would I miss Dr. Barry Fell the way we miss him now after his passing to the Lord because he, but he teaches well and after having translated it this time by yours truly, then, and, but I still must give credit to Dr. Barry Fell for the knowledge that he has passed on to his students and to those people that he has worked with and myself being one that is so very proud to have been a student of all his works and um, so I still give him credit for this translation even though that um, that he has now with the father all right so this turns out to be one of the most controversial and fantastic finds that has ever been found in North America, inasmuch as it documents, in part, how people, ancient visitors, came to this land, where they came from, and by the type of script, the Ogham, uh, utilized, we even know the approximate date, which would be the year of our Lord, 800 to 900 A.D., now, I repeat, from 800 to 900 A.D. After having personally seen those um, Ogham panels in Wyoming County, West Virginia, and Horse Creek, West Virginia, with the Christian messages there, with Cairo having been used in one, with rebuses in the other, to Christian writings, I feel that probably this party is, in as much as we're in Kentucky, not all that far away from West Virginia, that there was a connection between those panels and the writer uh, in this one. Not necessarily the case, but it was the same style, the same date um, period uh, that this particular vowelless uh, ogham was utilized. But these things are all documented, where they're from. And basically, one part that you will not see in this documentary is, because I'm still researching it in it, is that this particular person, the priest, states that he has a tender branch that he has well nurtured with water 
and that it is a beautiful apple tree. Evidently, they were planting apple trees, and I'm searching back in history in this county as far as we can, which our chances are not that good in as much as the apple tree is a tree that is really susceptible to diseases and so forth that, one, that any part of them could still be living after that many years. But in ancient history in this county, who knows? There may have been wild apples found in this area, and it would certainly help that part of the translation along. But the better part is that we know who they were, where they came from, and how loyal they were to our Heavenly Father, as far as that's concerned. This will naturally be very controversial to, as far as it is, pre-Columbian, naturally. Columbus discovered America in 1492. Well, it was a long time before 1492 that these travelers were in Kentucky, and they are from Europe, as you will see as we begin to translate. I certainly want to thank this, the gentleman that you've been introduced to for having taken us to this location. And certainly, if there should be a problem with the dating of this, there is still enough, I'll call it moss, that can be carbon tested in these various uh, places that will document the actual or approximate age. But to a student of Olgum, it isn't necessary, I don't feel, that especially with uh, three panels, as forementioned, Wyoming County, West Virginia, Horse Creek, West Virginia, and this, this, they three simply witness to each other. Fascinating. I know you're going to enjoy this, and, and certainly I consider it one of the master finds as far as ancient writings in America because so much information is um, brought forth for our benefit historically to document from stones that speak of any panel that I've ever that I have witnessed in North America as I stated and without repeating myself I think this will be a very controversial find because of the amount of knowledge that is their own so with that having been said Let's enjoy what was discovered, the meaning, the true meaning found on these stones. Here we have the stone itself that has fallen from the roof that was used for a panel. Now, concerning the apple tree, which I will not translate for you at this time, it would be to your, as you look at the picture, it would be the writing with, uh, how can I identify it? With, it looks like an upside down A to you, okay? Uh, that particular panel states uh, that uh, they had well watered this branch of the apple tree. And then we go on down, you will notice one particular part on that particular scope as looking like a sword, but we will talk to, about it and discuss it as we get to our various panels. All right, let's move to the first line, if we may, of the interpretation. And here we have it. You see some, oh, within this you're going to see Ogum II. You're going to see Ogum uh, I. You're going to see Greek. And you're going to see Latin. And if we can, we'll move on. The first letter you see, perhaps I should explain the first letter being Ogum II that looks like a star or it looks like two X's crossing each other. That is Ogum II and its value is the letter T. Now the translation. And in ancient Irish, it states um, Atamaya ad di m lam, which is hand, kai, Ro, which is Christ Jesus, um, and then El uh, Alpha and Rex. The Alpha is in Greek and Rex is in Latin. Translated to modern day English, 
uh, first the words as they are, I acknowledge thee, I acknowledge thee, the hand, Jesus Christ, body, first king. Now to Englishize it, it says, and abbreviated, I acknowledge thee, I acknowledge thee, Jesus Christ, the right hand um, of God, of course, first of, uh, first I take the liberty to translate as alpha, first or the beginning. First of our body and king. Uh, naturally, he is our king, he will always be our king. It is very interesting that you should note the Cairo, for it is the rebus that is the hand in the very center. By that I mean the Chi is an X, right in the very center of the hand, which you now have the translation over it. And then Rho would be much like the English P. In other words, the stem that comes up through the X in that hand, uh, right where it says Chi, there on your screen, you're basically in the center of the hand there, and now you can see it. You see a P that comes up through, and that is Cairo, which is Christ Jesus. So how do you translate this then? How about hand? Hand in ancient Irish is lamb, L-A-M. So you always look for an L and you always look for an M. L is two strokes below the stem line and M is one stroke uh, uh, through totally above and below the stem line. And of course the valve A inserted by myself is uh, uh, so indicated. Isn't that beautiful? On a stone that had fallen away from a wall by a beautiful river and that message of acknowledgement to Christ. Now if we can, let's move on to the next panel and we'll see what we can do with it. And here we're going to have the continuation uh, on that, just past the hand, okay? And it's M, which is human, or hand, or human hand. B, dick, is, it means springs or rises quickly. And uh, in im is heaven, thol king be wall. And it reads following Jesus Christ, the, uh, the first of our body and our king, the human hand springs or rushes towards heaven to our king and wall. And that completes that entire line. You will see the Latin R visible there at the top of the screen. Now, what a fantastic string in ancient Ogham. I'm glad, I hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed translating it and being on this site. I'm sure that we will be returning again for there is much more of it uh, there that we are not uh, going to bring forth in this particular lecture. Here we have the one that has the sword that I ask you to observe, all right? Notice the sword, and this is, this is amusing in a way because you'll notice the rebus that is a little man. See, there is legs at the bottom, and he's holding that spear in his hand, all right? Uh, look at the sword in the center, and then look at the rebus of the little man. That is a word and I'll read it to you as we go to the translation now, if we can have the translation back. In the Ogham, we have Moedid, Asmel, Mame, with S-C-M-L-L, which is to say, translated from ancient Irish, victory cry or a boast. In other words, I'm bragging. And Asmel uh, is wrapped in fire, part of a spear. In other words, my spear is wrapped in fire and then the other is no evil person. Now this is my translation. I boast with a victory cry. I raise my spear wrapped in fire. You won't find an evil person around here. And uh, so this, we had a happy warrior there and a very proud warrior. And evidently he was a can-do type person, my kind of person and to even sign it off with the little rebus, which the little man holding the spear in a, in a challenging way was you won't find an evil person around here. 
That's kind of the way it goes. When you can overpower your enemy, you don't have very many enemies. All right. But now get ready. I think this is one of the major finds in America, and it will probably be a long time before another find as major comes along. A benchmark, I call it, for teachers or students that know there were Europeans and other peoples from other lands, Asia, uh, the Mediterranean, many areas in America long before Columbus discovered America. Now, I will start the translation from, would be from your far left. As a matter of fact, you can see the mark that starts the string, and we will translate, and you notice that we have another rebus, a hand, and then lines following the hand. Quite a long string and what a message it carries, very anxious, and you're looking now at a wall. It's actually a wall from which the stone you just looked at next to a river fell from. This is an overhang. It is a place of shelter. And this is being the beginning of the string, and let's go with the translation when we're ready. Get ready for it. Fantastic. E-L-G, which is always the ancient name for Ireland. L-E-R, beyond the sea. Mac, M-A-C, a sun. D-U-S, to see and to find. That's to search. And R-O-B, it's a robe, specifically a priest robe or priest duties. S-E-L, which means at all times. My translation, translation, and it is accurate, listen to it, a son of Ireland from beyond the sea to find this land doing priest duties at all times. Think about it. Here we have in ancient Irish the actual location from which he came, his method of travel, the fact that he was a native, being a son, Mac, uh, is uh, always, many of you in modern day Irish, you hear MacDonald, son of Donald, okay? It's uh, very uh, well used. But again, a son of Ireland, we know here where they came from, with uh, ELG being the ancient name of Ireland. His method of travel, from beyond the sea, he crossed over the sea. To do what? To find this land. And what was he? Doing priest duties at all times. In other words, he did not give up his duties as a priest at any time when he was fulfilling his services of the trip. To me, that is a major find. It is, to my knowledge, one of the only panels found in North America that give the actual location and with the ability to date the panel by the type of Olgum used, we find a son of Ireland traveled beyond or across the sea in the year eight to 900 AD. He was a priest and it was priest that had the ability to write, that is to say, scribeship. And to me, it is fascinating, and quite frankly, it means that with full documentation that all school books in America should be changed from the fact that Columbus discovered America. He did not. He came to America, but he did not discover it. And any geologist or archaeologist uh, that allows common sense to prevail in finding and being able to date knows this for a fact. How many times must these beautiful finds be made before someone finally wakes up to the fact that there were many people in America before Columbus? He was a late comer. All right, let's go on with the rest of the translation. Here we have the rebus of the hand in that long string. and we translate it as such, D-E-S-L-A-M. You remember what lamb is? A hand, of course. 
G-N-A-E. The little circle in the middle of the hand is A-E with the G-N below. Dia is always God. And Lan, Rai, uh, Foma, Hai, which is to say, how beautiful the arrangement of God's hand. It can be translated, how beautiful the right hand of God. His arm, full of love, is open to me and whomever, and naturally, whomever will. We see that God was the protector. So the full string then being this son from Ireland uh, had come across the sea to discover this land, that is to find this land, not discover necessarily. And then how beautiful the hand of God or the arrangement or the word arrangement in ancient uh, uh, Irish can be uh, the arrangement naturally. When you lay your hand on this particular point, then um, uh, it, is, it takes a right hand to fit it, the, the rebus, the picture, the drawing of the hand. But how wonderful a string that this priest pours his hand, heart out and mind and even preaches while he's doing it that God's right arm, right hand, arm is always outreached to encircle and protect all those that would um, enjoy the very fact that he loves us. I had such a joy, it was such a joy to do this translation, to find this ogham, to have been taken there by such a fine gentleman. And if this county only knew, and I'm sure it will now, how beautiful the writings of God. The history, as you know, there was an, an elder, a very elderly gentleman that has fished this river for quite some time. And certainly he enjoyed it and has seen this drawing there for a long time. We even thank the Girl Scouts that noticed it and become inquisitive and would lead to our having been there. So, it's fantastic. Think we'll go back? You bet we'll go back. I want to see it again. I want to be there. I want to touch the stone and I want to continue translating the rest that is there that we did not uh, film. So, there you have it. A priest from Ireland in Kentucky, good old Kentucky, and documented for anyone to examine. However, that will not be possible, but I'm speaking of those with credentials that would wish. We must certainly protect this site. How very fortunate this county in Kentucky is to have such a find. All right, there you have it. Again, I think Dr. Fell for his many years of work in the languages that we, his students, the students of his work, can have the ability to do these things. We thank our Father as well. Hope you enjoyed it, and there you have it, Ancient Ireland in Kentucky. Okay, we're here in uh, Marion County, Alabama. You're going to see some fresh uh, petroglyphs and petrographs here at this site. We're still working out the interpretation, but there's one thing that's always easy to read, and that's a mortar indicating about how long someone was in the area. You will notice the depth of this mortar So someone was in this area for quite some time. We're going to pick this up here at one of the first drawings and we'll determine as we go along perhaps what people it was, but there is a perfect arrow which would be pointing uh, in a northerly direction, maybe a little northeast. You'll notice two perfect circles on each side of this. We'll be showing you more of these. What does it mean? Well, as we piece together the graphs, no doubt um, we'll have a pretty good idea, the meaning thereof. So 
always a directional marker. Now what could this mean? Usually an arrow can indicate to a main body of water a direction in which one particular group of people uh, traveled, whereby those that would follow would know where their people were, or their direction even for a return trip. Again, on this marker, a perfect arrow. The arrowhead is, is really uh, quite well done. And if we were to, if it were to be Indian, you can almost tell by the shape of this arrow what people it would be because it very much resembles certainly a well-fashioned point with the two circles. We'll move on around to another uh, site here and work, let's work a little more on it. Again, you're on a virgin uh, exploration trip here. Let's see if we can understand it. Probably never on television before. Okay, I want to draw strict attention to the spiral. A double spiral. And you know the meaning of this. It means water or a religious symbol being that this is Mother Earth receiving Father Son and uh, creating na uh, natural life on Earth. The last uh, explanation being America, early American Indian. Also, a spiral can be used in the sense of a directional pointer for this part right here. But it always means that water is near. And when you have a proper device to check them out, you'll find that they're always correct. And I don't know if we're going to be able to get it on camera, but to show that they're indicating water, there's the most beautiful natural spring hidden way down below with the sun shining on it. And I'm sure that'll pick up on camera because, you, Glenda, if you'll step back one step other way, dear. There, we have the water, the reflection from it, beautiful clear water. And, of course, the spiral indicating that. We have another symbol just past that could be a birth symbol from what people, I'm not sure yet. Like so. And as the gentleman that brought us up here, who I'll introduce you to, says this looks like a horseshoe. And it is a, in, uh, a U, a perfect U, double. We'll be saying more about that one also. We're gonna move now around to the other face of this bluff, and certainly we see some very interesting things. Okay, I want to call your attention to another set of spirals. Again, we'll do a little work on this because we have a perfect S here in the center with a spiral coming in, ying yang, in certain peoples from certain countries. But we have an interesting thing below this. I hope you're going to be able to see this. It has the prow of a ship, and evidently uh, this is one reason why I think much of this is not American Indian, but were travelers. And then we have a, a horn-shaped uh, direction here with another circle with an arrow pointing straight through it. Now, this resembles, in a sense, the early American Indian love flute. But I do not believe at this moment that's what it represents. We're going to investigate and we'll add a little voice track to this as we look at these a little closer. And I think we can begin to put a story together now of these people that evidently traveled here by ship. They were very conscious of water naturally because that is life. In the religious sense, as we begin to find more, it would appear that in a sense that we do have the, the uh, Mother Earth as she would conceive from Father, Son and give life to everything. Now, we're going to go to a symbol that is behind me now and come back to this. And we see a history of a travel. Let's see if we can put it together. Okay, ready to go? Uh -huh. Okay, we're going to look here and we see a sun symbol 
Above the sun symbol, we see another planet, could even be the moon. And then we have three particular celestial markers. What does this mean? It means east. And on the layout of this stone, it just so happens that is east. And here we have two symbols that would look like very <laughs> distinct lettering of some strange alphabet. Only you have to put your mind in the place of those people that traveled. Remember the boat, the ship? These people say from here, from the east, these are legs walking. Notice the bent knee here, straight leg here as he sets forth and he, meaning giving a direction. You have a perfect foot here, even down to the toes and the pad of the foot and the heel. Very well done with much precision. This is very, very old. It would seem that there is a symbol above this man or people walking. And unfortunately, the Fatima has covered it over, but I don't, I believe I, we, would, we could remove it to see, but I don't think that that's going to be possible because it is so ancient. But what was the message? We were walking. You know what their mode of transportation here was when they finally end up at the ship. They were walking through this country. And here we have an interesting, the old pitchfork, which is a letter. We'll do a little special emphasis on here as we move on eastward. And here we have some strokes. We have this symbol with an override. And then we have something that could even possibly be triogum. We have one complete stroke, that would be an M. We have another complete stroke, which would be a double M. And it's possible there was a mine somewhere in the area, for that's what this would mean in ancient Ogham. And there seems to be much uh, direction of pointing here. And then we have a stem, a stem line. One stroke below the stem, one across, an M, and another stroke below, BMB. BMB, some form of bale? I think not. We'll do a little work and a little thought on this. Directly above, this is very well incised and it is very ancient. It dates back uh, to at least Christ days. And then above this, we have an interesting thing again. We have another arrowhead. We have the two symbols here with a fork below pointing in a direction directly off the center of uh, the B as we see it on this stem line. Now, we're walking. We're walking from the east, which means what? We're going west. And again, the arrow with direction for emphasis. Another time, an arrow with direction. So uh, then again, I've never noted so much emphasis on one symbol. You will remember at the last site, that's, oh, about 25, 30, 30 to 40 feet from here was the lead into this. And then we come to the ship, which evidently there, this connects with a river that would be to the west of here. I can think of several rivers to the west of here. There would be, number one, the Miss, old Mississippi, which would be, oh, what, 200 miles to the Mississippi. And then the Tennessee runs not too awfully far from here, much closer. But much travel was allowed in here, and as you know, the rivers were the highways, the byways. Again, a spiral that's going to be very significant as we continue to research the ship, the half, the upside, the emptied out moon, which means empty, and what would appear to be and no doubt in si uh, put into the stone at the same time this heavy staff line, stem line, and the BMB, 
were placed here. How fascinating. As we look back into time, and it seems we can understand so much, and yet at the same time, the message they left is so interesting as we try to understand the heritage of not only this great nation, but the world. As God's people would migrate, God said he would scatter them, and certainly, as I've always told you, stones do speak if you'll pay attention and listen with understanding. I feel it is absolutely necessary that first we identify the people whereby we know how they thought, therefore we can put ourselves in their place and better understand the message that they have left in either worship, which it would indicate that certainly they did worship, and uh, with the spirals, which uh, spirals real heavy in Great Britain, the Celts used spirals. It's a strange thing, but spirals meaning water, as well as spirals can mean mining as well. 85% of the spirals found in Europe are in, a, in an area where the majority of the minerals are taken from the ground in one form or the other. I certainly am not indicating that this is a mineral strong area or anything. Again, why? There is one thing that's absolute that anyone could understand from this. These people were traveling. They give you their travels. It's obvious they spent a great deal of time in this area, and they produced some pretty good grain, nuts, corn, because of the mortar. And there are other mortars um, that uh, are not too far from here, three in one particular place, on a, two rather, on a stone. So there were a number of people, they were traveling. The precision of the artwork on the legs traveling again amazes me and I want to call attention back to it again not only are they traveling away from the Sun which means West but you actually have the toes the big toe the ball of the foot again the heel but you have the motion so as ancient as this is the message is still delivered with motion actually in it as we have moving pictures today. You have a moving picture here also. Again, I find it fascinating. I find it interesting. Many people might say, you mean you really enjoy those symbols that are on that rock? I certainly do. Because they give us a wealth of information concerning the ancient travelers, where they came from, what they believed, you see, we have two or three symbols that are going to identify who these people are as we investigate the travelers of the world and who these symbols were left by. Okay, here we are again, way down in the state of Alabama. I want to introduce you to a gentleman that has taken us uh, on a side expedition where I think we've found some real wonderful information. Old time family here in Alabama. I want to introduce him to you. We're standing in front of the, the old home place. Always brings back a lot of memories and it certainly brought back a lot of memories for me. Joel Palmer. Mr. Joel Palmer. Joel, thanks for having us. Good to have today. you here with us. Hey, I notice you've got several things on the wall that seem very familiar to me. Here's an old cross-cut saw. I wonder how many of you have ever used an old cross-cut saw. Joel happens to have wore a little off of this handle himself, <laughs> right, Joel? Thermites, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. and, and let's see what we have here. This, these are called hanes for you city folks that have, and I, I understand you've used this yourself. Did we have. Younger. Yeah. This is a collar, and from the size of it, you can pretty well guess this would be for a mule. And this, off of this hane, which is made of wood and this collar of leather and well padded, the traces, that's what hooked on back to the plow or whatever you happen to be pulling to a single tree, 
this is where the tug, the chain, or it could be leather. And this ring here was usually when you were pulling a wagon, there would be a snap ring that would come up and hook into this that would help the support the tongue between the two animals. And here I'm telling them what yeah. this stuff is. <laughs> well, we got this old plow up here, I think, is a very interesting thing myself. It was, uh, it was uh, used back probably in the 1800s. My dad was born in 1906, and he said they never used it in his lifetime. He just kept it as a spare or something around in case they ever needed it. And uh, so uh, I got it and cleaned it up and put wood preserver on it and keeping it as a souvenir or something for the past with a quite a bit more of uh, old things there. I believe you said you knew what that uh, was yes, right I, there. Yes, I know what this old yeah. walking plow, this is the type of plow that I tell you all, yeah. is, in, in the words of our father's word, is a man that is a professional plower, doesn't look back, or he's not worth hiring. And here you have a plow that's much like uh, I suppose the way this generation would understand it, like a water ski or even riding a, bi a bicycle, if you tilt it, it's gone. I mean, it's going to go, you're going to stop plowing a straight furrow. Well, this is what we have in mind when we talk about that. Yeah, I've got something else here you might, uh, the, uh, the Bible speaks of that muzzle. Yes. <laughs> Thou shalt not muzzle thy ox. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when you were in uh, plowing young corn or any kind of feed stuff or in a garden, this could come in very handy. Yeah, the, the mule would uh, buy the tops out of it. <laughs> Get those old silk uh, portion real quick like. <laughs> well, Joel, it's very obvious that you take great pride in your heritage. I do. Uh, he certainly, this is a home away from home. This is just the old home place. And and uh, he has his own personal family museum. Inside he has some wonderful things. We're going to try to show those to you. And I just want to say again, Joel, thanks for having us. It's good to have you here. And thanks for taking us out into the field. We're all excited about you coming. Uh, Joel, again, I compliment you as we're in this old log cabin, log house, home. And I see from the wall, which I removed this and too, from too dark a place to, to share with the people, it shows the great pride that you take in your heritage. Could you tell us a little bit about who these Palmers are? Yes. Uh, the first one here would be one of my great-grandfathers that come from England to North Hamilton County, Virginia in uh, 1649. And uh, he, he married... Uh, and he had his oldest son was Joseph. Was I've got there that he was born in England, but I've uh, I found some more records that uh, made me believe he was born in Virginia in uh, 16 and 45. And he re he raised a large family of children right there, where I guess a lot of the Palmers uh, branch off from. But his son Benjamin, I find in our line, born in 1684, died 1781. He too lived in North uh, Humberland County, Virginia, in the same area there. He died. Him and his wife both died the same day. I don't know. Uh, according to records, uh, they must have had some kind of sickness that both had it, and they left four, I believe it was, small children and other people in the family there. Took these kids and raised them. And Ellis, somehow, he wound up in Chesterfield County, Virginia, uh, right below Richmond, just a little ways, and he married Ann Rudd, and. Uh, when the uh, Revolutionary War come along, he volunteered. And at, at that time, uh, uh, George Washington was uh, was up there about ready to cross the, uh, the, uh, the old Delaware. And I had pictured him in my mind that there sat Grandpa uh, on the boat with him. But I, after I checked the records out of Washington, D.C., out of the archives, I got down to what he was doing exactly the same day that that happened. <laughs> and he was in the hospital, so I busted my bubble on that. <laughs> But he did, uh, he stayed in three years, and then, and then he re-upped and, and stayed. Uh, and, and then he got some land down in, uh, in uh, South Carolina, Union County, South Carolina, the, and he moved down there. And uh, that's where my great-grandfather great John Palmer was 
was born or where he lived. I believe he was born up there in, in, uh, in Virginia. In, in in Virginia. Yeah, then he came on down into South Carolina. And uh, he married Martha Williams. And he, uh, he read, I've got quite a bit of records on him. Uh, he, uh, he owned a big uh, farm plantation there right in Union, right about where the city of, of Union, South Carolina is now. He owned that area right in there and he, he's buried there uh, on the old family farm now. And the old house, uh, partly still standing, that he lived in. I've well. been, been in it at uh, similar, something similar to this. Well. Uh, but uh, he died in 18, 1828. And uh, he was a, a Revolutionary War soldier too. And I, I joined the Sons of the American Revolution through him. And wow. I got his records, and I couldn't. And uh, they, and they, uh, I verified the fact that he was the same John Palmer and up until uh, I joined the thing anyway. And but his son Benjamin Hezekiah, he was a, he was a fellow that just kind of a restless like fellow. He, he, he uh, liked to live right on the edge with the Indians and as the Indians, as they pushed the Indians back this way, he moved up. He stayed just right on the borderline until uh, uh, he died over here around Piedmont, Alabama in that area right there. And my, then my great granddaddy Russell Palmer, which I uh, have his picture right here, he, him and his mother and two brothers, which was John and Joseph Palmer, they came here in 1842 and settled uh, back over a little way from over, over there. And he lived in a house identical to this one, just about it. I, I took part of the parts off of his old house and moved them over here and, and, and put wow. them on this house. And uh, part of the, uh, that old house is this house because I, uh, I moved part of it over here. And uh, he lived all of his life right there. He built that, that house and uh, I believe uh, according to the family history it was uh, 1845 when he when wow. he built the house, and they lived there all their lives. They had 11 boys, and one girl, mm. and uh, which my granddaddy, John Howard Palmer, and they called him Doc. He was a he was a doctor. And most people around you knew him as Doc Palmer, and he was born 1858. He was a kid during the Civil War, and he had a lot of stories to tell. He was he wasn't old enough to go, but he he seen and heard a lot of things. He was quite a storyteller. And and uh, then my dad, he's in nursing home now, but he's uh, James Howard Palmer. In 1906. 1906. And, and well, I know he, he has quite a uh, quite a, an engineer in this county, built a lot of the br bridges and so forth, and I think that's fantastic. Yes, he's now, one. we had seen a crosscut saw out on the front of the cabin. Yeah. I guess that's just what you were yeah. feeding right here. Yeah. If, if I understand your dad would go up in the woods and cut a tree and drag it up with yeah. the mule, and when you got in from school... Uh, my job. <laughs> <laughs> to feed the fur. Yeah. It took I, a lot of wood, and it was, now, had to carry it in. On the mantel of the fireplace, I see two pictures there. Yeah. Now, which one of the... Um, Palmer's was this. That's Russell Russell Porter Palmer. He was uh, he was born in, uh, in Georgia on uh, Richmond Creek, Greene County, uh, Georgia. He moved here in 1842. He was single at that time, but he met uh, a Morning Dazini, and she was a Mansell, Morning Dazini Mansell, and uh, and they married shortly after he got here, and they they raised 11 boys and one girl. And here's something very interesting that you'll always find on the battlefields during the great Civil War. Yeah. Cannonball. Yeah. And Uncle Lillick and my granddad went up there, and I believe about 1870 to Chalo, and uh, they picked up several uh, all things like that. It was just a farm then, and the fellow that owned the farm was glad to get rid of that stuff. You get it on. <laughs> <laughs> And a so, lot of junk laying around. And, so a cannonball from Shiloh. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, they brought back quite a bit, but I wound up with a cannonball and one bullet and a... And uh, here's that one bullet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And But some of the other people in the family, I guess I got more of it than any of them because people knew I was interested in that kind of stuff. And they actually, Robert Palmer, a cousin of mine, gave me that, that ball because of his father that brought it back. Actually, my grand, my cousin's got the one my granddaddy brought back. I didn't. Well, 
I see so many things that we could spend all yeah, day. An old sausage meal. An old sausage meal. Well, Back in butcher and day, these things were always so important. Yeah. This was the old coffee grinder. The old coffee grinder. Yeah, they would, uh, you know, bring in their coffee beans and put them in, and then grind them, mm -hmm. and then set it on the fire. And when they first, uh, the oldest settlers didn't have a stove. Actually, all the cooking they did was right there. You see where they sharpened their knife with that rock? Cause I, I remember yeah. seeing my mother. I remember yes. seeing my mother sharpen the knife right there on that. Well. This, this lets you know how it is, it is passed on, yeah. that um, we see these marks in some places that are tool marks on rocks where the Indians near their fields or anyone would sharpen their tools. Yeah. Well, thank you very much Good for sharing you. with yeah, us your yeah. heritage, and I must compliment you that you're one American that cares about his heritage. And I think we have something else in common. There's a little town in Korea called Yongdong Po. Yeah, I yeah. think we was at the same time. Right. You know? I made in from Anchon, and you came in from down yeah. south. And yeah. There we were. Again, Joel, thank you very much. We appreciate you and your heritage is without question. We'll have you back anytime. Thank you.